No question of surrender. The battle for beer had shame. Um, I'm back. This is the new game I'm going to be trying to play for y'all. Uh, since my last series I did was Roads to Leningrad, the Vance Von Boris uh, GMT game that's part of the Roads series, although there's really just two games in that series. Um, finished doing that a couple months ago, and I've been kind of busy, but now I think I have time carved out that I can tackle uh, doing at least the first scenario and going over some of the overview of this Grand Tactical Series game. Uh, many wargamers are familiar with the Grand Tactical Series, especially if you enjoy World War II. Um, because they're really, they're, they're very, they're very well, they're very well known for being, um, highly engaging games. They've covered sort of, uh, what is it? Uh, a market garden. They did, they broke up market garden into two different games, uh, where Eagles dare and devil's cauldron. Um, both of those are regarded very highly by people who own them. They are sort of expensive. They're hundreds of dollars. Uh, it's thousands of counters and really nice maps and whatnot. Uh, people just like this system um, because it's very tactical, as the name suggests, and uh, it does give you sort of that really gritty feel of the battle. Not quite on the same granular level as, say, you know, ASL, but these are these units are still very small groupings of people. The scale is generally, you know, a few hundred kilometers, so you definitely feel more uh, up close on the battle instead of these sort of where war games traditionally look at division level sort of operations. Uh, this one is purely tactical and is really revolving around company and battalions, uh, but battalions being represented by multiple pieces. So um, you, you definitely get a smaller scale here than even we did in the road system, which is sort of a operational tactical game um, or strategic tactical. I guess, you know, we got the three levels, right? Tactical, strategic, and operational. Uh, this one is definitely tactical, uh, but fits into a larger, maybe strategic plans if you play some of the larger games. This one is a smaller um, smaller module they put out that's, you know, it was only 60 or $70. I think I've got it on sale online. Um, but it represents really just one battle. It has four scenarios. It's this battle for beer. Uh, I, I'm saying it's beer has shame. It might be beer had shame or something. Maybe someone online will give me, or I'll look it up because when I'm not lazy, the phonetical uh, pronunciation. This was a battle in North Africa. It was between the free French forces and the combined German and Italian forces that were rampaging across North Africa at this time. Um, this was the southern tip of the Gazala line, and it was an old abandoned sort of uh, fort built during uh, the Ottoman period. So it was a Turkish fort. And uh, it became sort of, you know, used again when the free French forces uh, came under siege. They were at the southern tip. This was sort of the strong point. And so Rommel and Rommel's forces and some of the Italian uh, forces he had with them surrounded this fort and over the series of about a week or so, uh, slowly got them to withdraw. But because of the delay in action there, you know, that had several uh, implications for later on in the battles in North Africa. Um, North Africa is not my period of expertise. I'm, I mean, I'm not even a huge World War II person, per se. Uh, I mean, I study Russian history, so I know a lot more about the Eastern Front. Um, but nonetheless, you know, desert warfare has many of its own fans and aficionados, and I would be remiss if I didn't try a North African game at some point. Uh, and this one seemed good because I wanted to try the Grand Tactical series. This is a good way to get into it because it's not it's not so grand. Uh, the, the pieces on the board are going to be, you know, there'll be enough on there, but it won't just be, you know, maps on maps. And uh, and the scenarios are quite manageable and handleable. So I figured what we do today is take a look at uh, some of the stuff that comes in the game. I want to show you sort of the setup of the first scenario. And we're also going to look at some counters. And uh, then from there on, we'll just start playing and pushing things around. And uh, we'll go from there. So let's... Uh, Let's take a look at the map. Let's take a look at what we got here. So I'll just go ahead and stand up. So this is this is the map that it, it comes with. You know, it's just a one mapper. And most of it's just got uh, information on the side for you to play your game. These are the player aids I put out here. The map here is just is really just this. And the scenario we're playing today, as you can see, is sort of uh, outlined by the green. So very small amount of area, and really what we're looking at here is some French forces, free French forces here, some infantry and guns, uh, and a mortar piece, and then we have some atta attacking Italian battalion of uh, tanks, I believe. Oh, they're in column. So, oops, there we go. So not a whole lot of pieces. This is really just a training scenario, and in fact, really, the Italians are going to get clobbered because uh, the French just have a superior defensive position. They have uh, a nice gun here and a good mortar unit, and 
as we'll talk about later, these units can lay down barrages. Well, actually, mortars can lay down barrages. Um, I believe it can too. I have to double check the gun. And that can make it difficult to get around or move because what's interesting about this game is it does not have zones of control. So units do not project a zone of control because we're talking about the tactical level here. And zone of control makes a lot more sense if you're dealing with a, uh, a much bigger map, a much more broader scale because you're covering much larger distances. Well, actually, it might make less sense with zones of control because you have such large distances. It can be argued that some units just can't cover that much ground around them, project force around them. But it would, it's difficult to have systems at that level where you don't have some sort of you know, zone of control. This game does not utilize zones of control. So as you get closer to these units, <clears throat> you can just come up to them, dance around them, run around them, and there's no real movement penalty to do that, and you don't get stuck. What this game does instead is it has sort of firing zones. So as you get closer and closer to some units, they have firing zones to project out, and if you come into them, they can conduct opportunity fire pretty much every time you do something. Uh, every unit can be targeted by multiple units. So as you get closer to well-defended positions, you begin to realize what a slog it really was for some troops and how you really had to capitalize on any kind of opening you got or break because you just would, would get mowed down. And as you'll see when we play this scenario, this is essentially what will happen because the goal of the Italians over there The goal for them is to motor down and get into actually the fort itself in any kind of hex and stay there unsuppressed uh, by the end of two turns. So very difficult because they're going to have to basically move up quickly, take a lot of opportunity fire as they approach the fort and then somehow knock out one of these guys and then take their place. Um, it's almost impossible. I mean, it could be done, I guess, if you got really good rolls and, and we'll see if that actually happens. One thing you may have noticed right away is that the units in the Grand Tactical Series do not use standard NATO symbology. So here we have uh, some Italian units here. At first, I gotta say, this kind of threw me off. I um, spent so much time getting used to NATO symbology that to find units that didn't use it, and it was just like, oh, I gotta learn uh, all these designations again. Like, it's just not gonna be instantly recognizable like it was for me when I played with NATO uh, units. But honestly, now that I've tinkered with the, the components a little bit and put the counters down, and I've played a little bit on Vassal, and I've moved some things down here, you know, I, I kind of like it. I'm growing to like it more and more because it does give you more of that period feel. You know, these were the this is the markers that the French forces would use. So we have, um, I believe, yeah, these are our infantry units, ones with circles that have sort of the cross coming at the top. The square ones are machine gun units. This uh, square with the line coming through is a mortar. And uh, this is just a, I don't want to say it's an artillery gun. I think it is maybe artillery, though. Um, but it's designated there with a circle and, a, and sort of a line coming out of it. Uh, similarly, if we look at some of the German units, I, the tanks, any kind of uh, vehicle is going to have its own silhouette, so that's actually very nice. But if we pull out, say, some nice German units here. I have to remember, but yeah, so like this is a mortar unit for the Germans. Kind of looks like a mortar, you know. Uh, this is an infantry designation, a little square with a thing on it. A rectangle with a black line at the end. And I forget how they designate motorized, but as we come to them, I'll point these out when we use them in scenarios and what the designations are. So it takes a little getting used to because it's just not what you, it's just not, you know, unless you grew up in, the, in an Italian culture and did Italian war games and played those things that didn't use NATO symbols, you probably wouldn't know these. Um, so there, that's one thing the Grand Tactical Series says. The other thing they do is they really do go for more of that realism, and so even the command markers you use, like this is the free French marker, uh, obviously that's French for direct command. <laughs> and here's the one for Italian. Uh, so they use the actual language. You know, it's just a, it's just a little bit more to get you immersed, and uh, I could see that being off-putting for some people, but really it's just so easy to adjust to after a while that if you play these games, you'll get used to it. Um, and honestly, like, with most of these battles, I mean, this is going to be German and Italian forces and, um, you know, French. There's not too many different, you know, symbologies to remember. Um, yeah, so one of those things that I kind of didn't like at first, but, you know, I like it now. I think it really does add to it. Um, a lot of people are not going to be very impressed with this map. I should have mentioned we had the map because it's really just a desert map. <laughs> it's just desert terrain. It's kind of hard to see because it's all grainy, so my camera's not really want to focus on it. Um, I guess I have better light. I wonder if that's going to be an issue when I'm recording here. Well, we'll find out. We'll see how it looks. Anyway, um, the map is not particularly uh, inspiring, but it is a desert warfare, so desert warfare was not exactly inspiring terrain. This was mostly desert, 
I mean, I guess you could have some really nice mountains or cliffs or escarpments or whatever they call them in this area. So that, that you know, but this is not a, a highly geographically diverse area. This is mainly desert, so a lot of your units are going to be just on the open plain. You won't see a lot of defensive terrain modifiers because you're not, you know, there's just no mountains. But one big dif difference is the fort itself, as you can kind of see outlined uh, with that line and some of the setup areas for various scenarios. These give uh, French forces that remain in them a nice little bonus um, to lots of their stats, which we'll go over in just a second when I look at counters. So, you know, if you're trying to find... So in a way, this is a good good introduction to the system, I feel like, because it does cover just a lot of the basics you need. You don't get too much in the corrupt. It does have everything. This module does include, like, air power points, uh, replacements, and all the different kind of rules you would have in the, in the larger games. But you're just not going to get a lot of that terrain difference. I think the one thing they add in here, just to give it a little variability, is minefields. And so those are a little different, and we'll talk about those later. But uh, once again, it's really just desert, minefield, or fort. Whereas if you're playing, you know, some of the, the market garden games, you're going to see a much, much wider variety of terrain. Okay, so that's a little bit of rambling on about the game. Uh, I guess I should mention up front, it's a chip pull game. I did show you some of the chits. It's kind of the reason I like these games, because uh, chip pull is a little bit easier, I think, for me to solo. Uh, this is a true chip pull game. Uh, Roads is a chip pull game in my mind. Roads to Moscow, Roads to Leningrad, but it's more of a... I go, you go chit pull, where obviously one side pulls a chit, next side pulls a chit, next side pulls a chit, and you, and you do so until the end of the turn. Uh, games like this, games like uh, World at War, that's done that's by lock and load, uh, those are true chit pull games in my opinion, because you literally put all the chits into a cup for both sides, you just continue to draw them, and, and then there's some sort of way determining the end of the turn. Uh, in this game, the last chit drawn of a turn becomes the first chit of the next turn, so a, a fairly easy system. Um, but one that is truly chip pull. So you will be seeing perhaps one side moving a couple times before the other side does. And, and I, I think at this scale, that's really appropriate tactical stuff because it wouldn't work so much if they did, if the other, if your opponent did not have so many abilities to conduct opportunity fire or sort of reaction moves. I won't say reaction moves, they don't really move as much, but they do conduct opportunity fire, which means if you take your time and set up a nice offensive position, it's gonna be hell to get through. And you're gonna see that soon enough. So. I think the pull, the, the true chip pull mechanic works great for the series. It also makes it, of course, very solo friendly. Um, that's one thing I do like about it. Okay, so I can, now I've rambled on enough about it. Um, let's take a look at some of the counters, and then let's talk about some of the values counters have, um, because that'll help make a little bit more sense of what's going on. All right, so I got to pull my rules out because I even I have to remember. I'm still getting used to some of these things, so it's, it's all still very new to me in a lot of ways, but you know, you get it down. So let's go ahead and take this guy, this nice little infantry unit. Okay, brief uh, interruption there. I hit the stop button by accident so I can move my camera. All right, so let's take a look at this French uh, infantry unit. So you see lots of different colors and values. Um, let me tell you what the numbers mean, and we'll talk more about the rest. So if you look here, the big number here, this is the fire rating of the unit. It not only measures how powerful it is on a scale of, I believe, uh, 0 to 9. I don't know if there's anything that goes above 5 or 9. I don't think it gets to 9, but I do know some units get above 5 for sure. Um, the number tells you how strong your unit's firing power is, or fire rating, and then the color denotes what kind of fire rating it is. This, I believe, is a small arms uh, uh, fire rating because it's just an infantry. If you take a look at, say, this mortar unit here, uh, it has a green one and that means it's a mortar fire. So when you look at the CRT, when you're trying to figure out your results, you use the firing class, I guess, of whatever unit you have. So this is a green one, it's mortar, that one's pink, so it's uh, small arms. There are white ones, which are dual, which means they could be a smaller or larger kind of fire. And then I believe there is also a direct, uh, direct fire chart, which sort of means like larger artillery pieces or whatnot. I say all that, and I could just pull the CRT out right here. So that I can look at it. Oh, did I move that guy? Of course I did. Say, I'm sorry. Okay, camera. Sorry. Yeah, we have dual purpose small arms, armor piercing, mortar, and indirect and direct uh, artillery fire or HE rounds. So that's what this top number is. So that tells, tells you what kind of firing unit it is and how powerful it is. Okay. This bottom number is its defensive rating, and uh, lower is better. Negative numbers are better. And as you do certain things like go into column or whatnot, it's going to adjust uh, your rating. Uh, if you're suppressed, if you take cohesion hits, 
um, it's going to reduce these stats. So you start off with zero, and, and differing terrain can modify that for you, but that's defensive value. The lower number right here, that is your assault rating. Uh, and assault is one of the things about this series that I just I'm not real keen about. It is a complicated, messy, uh, funky little procedure you have to go through. Uh, I think I've read on the forums that they're going to simplify the assault procedure for the next revision of the series. Uh, I'm looking forward to that because honestly, I think the rules are not too crazy. I find the rules to be fairly easy to understand uh, once you kind of start playing with the chits. I find assault to be just terrible <laughs> and I find it to be really onerous. And I just, it's a clunky, clunky system in what otherwise is a fairly elegant system in a lot of ways. Uh, it's fairly easy to figure out firing and doing your sort of attacks and figure out the CRT results. With Assault, you have something like, I'll just have to show you the procedure. It's many different levels. You have up to three rounds of combat. There's lots of back and forth and reaction. It's just kind of a mess. And I feel like it doesn't need to be that complicated for the kind of system we're depicting here. Especially when you look at how easy it is to conduct firing you just sort of look at assaults and go, man, that's just, it's just too much. Unfortunately, you need to use assaults because um, you have to push units around out of hexes, of course, right? And it's not always guaranteed. I don't think the CRT has retreat results. Yeah, you don't have retreats. You either lose step, you can become suppressed, you can take a cohesion hit or be eliminated. So there's no moving units by fire alone. You're going to have to push them around with assault. So that's kind of one thing that is, uh, in my mind, sort of detracts from the series, is salt is just a mess. But I have read that they are going to try to simplify it. I do have faith because I think you can find a pretty realistic system and cut the complexity by a lot. So anyway, that was a large uh, ramble just about that value, the assault value. These numbers over here, the top one is the troop quality. And if you remember sort of, you know, tactical games have troop quality. It's sort of an innovation that's been around for a while and, and it makes a lot of sense, right? Higher quality units can do more things. They can pass more roles. In this game, uh, there is a, a common role that's called the troop quality check. And you'll be using it for a lot of different uh, scenarios or outcomes. So of course, a unit with higher troop quality passes those checks more. <laughs> the bottom number is your movement allowance. And uh, that's just essentially what it is, right? How far you can go. Some units have what they call organic transport, or not organic transport, but they just can, they can transport themselves. Like this one has a transport on it. So as part of its movement, it could you know, load onto the trucks that accompanies this unit, and then it gets a much higher, as you can see, movement rating. Uh, it does lose, um, what is this? Oh, it does not have a fire rating, and I have to remember what this plus two is. Oh, the defensive rating, that's what it is, because it can't fit the bottom. Its defensive rating is much higher, so it's easier to hit. They're much easier to target because they're trucks, and they're not dispersed troops in a field. So you may be thinking, okay, the flip side is a truck. Uh, is this a one-step unit? We, you know, we can take step losses. Uh, how do you know how many steps the unit has? Well, that's up here at the top. And if it's just two dots, that means it's a two-step unit. And if it's got that little black uh, rectangle around it, sort of, that means that it can be transportable. And, and that's obvious because when you flip the unit, it's it's got its transport on the other side. Uh, in this game, you just use markers to denote a lot, which is going to be kind of I can see this getting really hairy fast, like a lot of counters being stacked on things because you have to mark cohesion hits, you have to mark um, suppression results, and any sort, and if you go into column or not. So let me see if I can pull out some of those markers and we'll take a look. So probably the most common one, one of the most common ones, especially when you're talking about movements, we just dealt that is the column marker. So in this game, if your units are not in column, they it costs more to cross terrain. So in this game, like there's a lot of desert, for example. Well, if you have, um, if you're not in column, I believe it costs three or two, depending if you're wheeled or not. Uh, some units obviously are wheeled. We'll talk about this one. This guy's a leg infantry. Um, that's why his movement allowance is actually that color. This will change, but the white means uh, leg infantry. In contrast, let's take a... This guy's tracked. He's got the red one. Oh, he's like, I think it's tracked. Yeah, because uh, there is wheeled and tracked, I believe. So he's got that red 18. That means he's tracked. Obviously, he's a silhouette, so you kind of get that in your mind automatically. But you can see right here, right? He's got the two steps, but he doesn't have his own transport because he is his own transport. So this one of the few ones that actually you can flip over to denote the step loss. Otherwise, we'll have to just mark it with, uh, with various add-on markers, which you can see can be kind of a pain. There's a lot of counter flipping. When I was playing this on Vassal, it's much easier because Vassal just does these kind of things 
more naturally like stacking counters, seeing things in a, in a glance really easily. Uh, here, this might be more of a challenge because of course, as you can see, when you go into column, you lose one off your fire rating, you lose, you get two on your defensive rating, so you actually become easier to hit, and you lose one off of your assault rating. So you're less effective at assault, you're less effective at firing, and you're easier to hit. The bonus though is that when you're in column, you get much more favorable movement rates. So roads become one movement instead of two or three, um, and that can that automatically you know triples your range essentially. Because though column gives you such an advantageous movement ability, you can only have one unit that's in column in a hex. You can't have two in column units in one hex. In this game, you can have up to four units in a hex, three that are not in column, and one that is. And there are some rules, like you can't cross a bridge unless you're in column. You can't enter a town hex uh, for some units unless you're in column. Uh, so being in column is uh, an essential way to get around. It is also makes you an easier target, and so there are rules about how you can go into column as, a, as part of your movement, then move around, um, but you can't enter column and leave column uh, in the same turn without taking a penalty. In this case, it's a, a cohesion hit, is something you can take if you want to do that. But normally in the game, uh, you can only just get into column or leave column in a turn. You can't do both. I mean, you can, but you'll, you have to suffer the penalty. Um, and there's more rules because like if you're on a transport and you get off a transport, you can decide if that unit's in column or not. Uh, when units come in as reinforcements, uh, you, you can decide if they start in column or not. So it is possible to start in column, move around and get out of it and not suffer the penalty because you started in column. So the other thing that is big is uh, cohesion hits. Let me see if I can find the cohesion hit. Here we go. Cohesion hits are the slow degradation of your troops. You can get these a lot of ways um, <clears throat> through combat results, uh, through trying to leave column if you've already entered it in a turn. And as you can see, what it does is it just sort of takes your firing rating down one and your assault rating down one. If you suffer another cohesion hit, it can double on you here, and then you get minus two, and then you also suffer minus one to your troop quality. And if you take another cohesion hit after that, uh, it becomes a step loss. There's also suppression. Suppression is very handy in this game. It's something you really need to learn to use because this is how you can immobilize units and sort of get the advantage and keep them in your line of fire and don't let them squirrel away, right? Because you don't have zones of control. So with suppression, you can see automatically you get no fire rating, you get minus two to your assault rating, you lose one for your troop quality, and you cannot move. So the units that are suppressed essentially are stuck in space. Um, <clears throat> and so there's a lot of things like if you get hit with barrage fire, like from a mortar, uh, you can choose to negate a uh, suppression result by taking a cohesion hit. So that's another one of those things where if you want to leave column and you've been column, you take cohesion hit. If you don't want to be suppressed, you take a cohesion hit. And these are how these things pile up. And you can rally to remove cohesion hits and suppression results as an action, but of course you got to pass rolls, and if you're next to enemies, it's much more difficult to do so. Um, a big part of this game, as, we, as we'll see, is using your units to suppress other units because that's how you're going to keep them fixed. It's how you're going to be able to eliminate them with sustained fire and whatnot. And it's also just going to reduce the maneuverability of, their, of your enemy units if you can keep them suppressed. Um, so those are the markers you can put on it to designate sort of different, I don't know, status adjustments based on what's going on. So you can see how I've just brought out a couple markers, but it could be, you could have units in column, has two cohesion hits and is suppressed. Well, that's four markers <laughs> on top of one counter. So yeah, this could get this could get hairy pretty quickly. You need to really stay on top of what you're doing. And luckily the counter density, at least for this scenario and the next one, is not so high. So it's it's very manageable. But it's one of those things where when you, if you play it on Vassal, man, Vassal makes it just so easy. And then you you play this and you're like, oh right, <laughs> much more difficult. Uh, anyway, so that's units. I think if there's anything else I want to need to discuss. Um, Honestly, you'll just see a lot when I go through the game. The rules, I, I, like I said, I found pretty easy to understand. My only quibble with them is that they are written in this uh, conversation style, sort of like... I mean, it just sort of repeats itself a lot. It's really informal, and they try to do it that way because then they also give you this uh, like rule summary, which is nice because it's only like three or four pages. You know, it's, it does really a good job. But the thing is, you you can't understand really what this is about until you've read the bigger rules. And the, these rules, in my mind, are just not organized as well. And so you, you turn to this more, but then you're like, oh, I'm missing certain key points that I really need to know here. There are some things in here that are not in here. 
So it is, it is sort of, uh, it's an adjustment. So of course I've done what I did last time, I made a player aid. And it's not wholly essential, I don't think. There's a lot of stuff here that because this sort of summary is really good, has nice flow charts when we're trying to do things that we'll be using for like direct fire. Uh, but like, here's the assault, like I was talking about. There's the assault chart. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy big and long. I mean, I had to take up, here's my summary of it, assault part one. And then Assault Part 2. So I had to make even a giant player aid just to describe that. Uh, I did put my sp specific scenario rules here. And then I just sort of have a description of what the chits do. Because the different chits do let you do different things. And, you, and that's part of the crux of the system, of course, is the chit pull. And a lot of your strategy depends on what kind of chit you pull and what kind of actions you can perform. Um, and we'll talk more about that as we actually get into the game. So that's sort of an overview of what we're going to be talking about and playing. Um, I'm excited to tackle this series. I've been wanting to do so for a while. I know a lot of people have been interested in, in having this played out more. I know that there is, uh, I forget his last name is Ty. He does a lot of really great YouTube videos. He's been doing, I believe, Devil's Cauldron. Maybe he did Where Eagles Dare a little bit. Um, and his videos have been great. I mean, that's what got me into the series, was watching those and, and realizing, okay, this is, this is something I can actually play and, and grasp, and I'm not gonna be totally lost. Um, so, you know, big props to Ty. Obviously, anybody that does this kind of work doing videos, you're helping people out with getting these game systems down. So I'm gonna do my little part and I'm gonna probably record this opening scenario just so we can see how things move, how things work. Uh, it's not gonna be very competitive <laughs> unless we just get terrible rolls. So when I come back, we will start tackling the very first scenario uh, titled The Italians Attack. 